Welcome back. This is Public Goods Chapter, Chapter 7. This is the last part, Part 4. In this part, we'll talk about public provision of public goods. If you don't know what a public good is, go back to Part 1, where we explicitly talk about pure public goods, where goods are non-rival and non-excludable. There's an awesome lecture. Go catch that up first. And we'll also talk about crowding out effect. Let us get started. All right, so in principle, government could solve the optimal public goods provision problem, okay? So it can provide it directly or mandate individuals to provide the amount. So government could either collect my trash every Friday, let's say, or government can tell me, you are not to leave any trash outside, you are to take your trash to this public incinerator at some location every week, something like that, okay? So... In practice, there are three problems of public provision of public goods. Number one, crowding out. This happens when it's already being uh, provided by private parties. The second part is measuring costs and benefits of public goods. This is going to be the next chapter. We are studying cost-benefit analysis. And last part is determining public's preferences. What do people want? All right, let's get started. The problem of crowd out. If private market already providing a socially inefficient level of public good, let's say I am that rich person who is providing fireworks show every year that costs me half a million dollars. I'm doing it because I love fireworks and I want this town to watch it. I don't have that kind of money. I don't have that kind of net worth actually at the moment. And I don't do it. It's just an example. So if I'm already providing half a million dollar fireworks show for the 4th of July, and let's say government steps in and provides more of the public good, private sector may actually start providing less. So firework example with Ben and Jerry, if you don't remember this, go to part one and two of chapter seven. If you assume Ben and Jerry care only about the total number of fireworks, okay, government provision financed by charging equal amounts to each of them, and government provides fewer amount of fireworks than being provided provide, uh, privately beforehand, okay? So each one dollar of public provision will crowd out private provision for one for one in terms of this model and assumptions. So government, you know, provides a uh, half a million dollar fireworks show that I'm going to stop providing mine, right? I'm like, okay, it's already here. So full crowd out is rare, okay? So this is one-on-one -on -one crowd out is rare. Partial crowd out is common and can occur. So let's say government is providing 200, according to this model, is government is providing $200,000 worth of fireworks. I may still be like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna cut down by $200,000. I'm going to still provide a $300,000 worth of fireworks. So this is full crowd out. So this is rare, it says theory. Partial crowd out is very common and can occur when people who don't contribute to the public good are taxed to finance its provision. These conditions are really important. So let's say the city starts taxing people for this fireworks show, then that's a problem. Or when individuals get utility from their individual contributions as well as the total amount of the public good provided. If non-contributors forced to help pay for the good, but it's still below the social optimum. The contributors' effective income levels are higher than before, okay? Or income effect, contributors buy more if the public good is normal good of setting the crowd out to some extent. So, so under these conditions, you may have partial crowd out effect, okay? So when government starts providing a pro previously privately provided public good, Private providers may actually start scaling back, partially. Alternatively, as we talked about it previously, there may not be full crowd out if individual cares about his or her own contributions, the warm glow effect. In this case, an increase in government provision will not fully crowd out giving. Okay, so... Partial crowd out is seen. Okay, so measuring the crowd out, there is an empirical evidence I would like to talk about it. A study found that every $1 increase in government funding for public radio, private contributions fall by 13.5 cents. Interesting, very interesting. It has some bias issues, but there is a no full crowd out. So government helping with public radios, NPR, $1 increase in government funding. Contributions fell only by 13 
uh, 0.5 cents, 13.5 percent. So there's a partial crowd out definitely happening. In another study, we talked about this again. Individuals contribute to the public good in a lab setting by contributing tokens they were given in to a common fund. So a two token tax on every player was then uh, contributed to the public good. Okay, without warm glow effects players should have reduced their contributions by two tokens because let's say I'm given a bunch of tokens, right? And I contributed to a public fund, right? This is a lab experiment at the university. So then government starts taxing me two tokens to put in this fund. I'm going to reduce my contributions to the fund, but less than two tokens. So there is no full, full crowd out. There's a partial crowd out. So however, each player cut their contributions by only 1.43 tokens. So we do keep contributing. That's great. Of course, we talked about this before. Lab experiments have their limitations. We talked about, right, they're being observed. This is a selected sample of students, so on and so forth. So the true extent of crowd out remains an important question. We don't know, but there is partial crowd out. Second limitation is measuring the costs and benefits of public goods. It's really hard to measure costs and benefits of public goods. And many people misunderstand how we measure it. Sometimes double, cost, uh, double count the cost of public goods. This is the next chapter, one of my favorite chapters ever. Okay. So this requires cost-benefit analysis next chapter, as I said. For instance, improving a highway involves valuations of commuting time saved as well as reduced traffic fatalities, and then this should be accounted in the cost-benefit analysis. So the last one is how to measure preferences for a public good. So, so far we assume that government knows preferences of everybody, right? So how can government know everybody's preferences regarding public and private goods? So in practice, this runs into problems with, we're going to study all these, so exciting, preference revelation, preference knowledge, and how do we aggregate preferences as well. So these issues are going to be addressed in the political economy chapter coming up. We're going to learn about voting and aggregating people's preferences. I will see you in the next chapter where we will be covering cost benefit analysis that's chapter eight i can't wait to see that but before that if you've seen this video up to this point you have seen it right you're watching it learning hit the like button and this action will help other students to benefit from these videos so everybody in the world will do better in economics number two subscribe to this channel because there will be more content coming up i'll see you in the next chapter bye